uh, honorable members of the uh, Vatican, uh, the Academy, and uh, respected colleagues, uh, it's been a great privilege to be here. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be uh, to this uh, amazing uh, meeting we are having. Um, so uh, we have heard a lot of a uh, lot about the Anthropocene. That's the topic of the conference. But we've also heard a lot of perspectives from the astronomers uh, in, in this session. Um, I'll take a slightly different um, uh, take um, uh, point of view here from a cosmic perspective, uh, which is that to me it's just amazing, uh, just the realization that the human species can have such a big impact on the environment that it becomes an observable phenomenon from outside the solar system. So in other words, if this were happening on another planet, Today, this, uh, the Anthropocene and what we have done to our climate is basically, ironically, uh, a proof of concept that we could use pollution signatures and other exoplanets to infer the presence of an advanced civilization, uh, which, which, is, which is an interesting observation in and of itself. But we also, in the last 100 years, have realized that life, actually, it's not just the humans, but all kinds of life has been mod uh, modulating the atmospheric composition over billions of years. And our challenge as astronomers is to use the atmospheric compositions of planets elsewhere to work out the possible biosignatures and biota that could be on those planets. Okay? So, so we are really seeing the effects of Anthropocene and uh, other uh, life forms in other parts of the history as a planetary phenomenon that could be observable if we had mirrors of our civilizations elsewhere. Okay? Uh, the other uh, point I would like to make is that we have seen uh, just in the last 70 years, 70 to 100 years, major advancements that have happened in, in the physical sciences. We have seen the quantum revolution uh, in physics and chemistry and the biology and artificial intelligence more recently. I would like to uh, make the rather provocative claim right at the beginning that we are probably the first civilization, uh, first uh, in our species, uh, that would have the chance to detect uh, life elsewhere. Okay. It is possible, what we are seeing with our current observations, the capabilities that are coming, that is in the next one to two decades, there is, there is a realistic chance that we may detect signs of life elsewhere. So I'll come back to this uh, by the end of my talk. So when you look up in the night sky, um, so it's very easy to wonder if that uh, blue sphere that we are seeing is it uh, alone in the universe, uh, both as a planet and as a planet bearing life. Now, we know of, we have known of uh, planets in the solar system, but until about 30 years ago, we did not know of any planet outside the solar system at all. Now, thanks to pioneering work by DDA and followed by many other uh, people in the field, today we know that exoplanets are extremely common and extremely diverse. We know of over 5,000 exoplanets today of all uh, of all kinds, all full range of masses, radii, orbital parameters, and so on. And uh, what we have realized is that the small planets are about the most common out there. More than 50 to 70 percent of the planets, of these thousands of planets we know of, are planets that fall between Earth and Neptune in the solar system in size. And those are also the planets that have no analogs in the solar system. So are they planets that are bigger versions of Earth, or in other words, super Earths or smaller versions of Neptunes or super, uh, mini Neptunes, we have no idea right now. So, so this is where we are. Uh, we have lots of planets that we know of, but we also have lots of open questions on their very nature. And there are various uh, telescopes that have been used in the past uh, that to discover these planets, and there are uh, some operating currently, and there will be more in the future, that are trying to find these planets around smaller, um, uh, uh, smaller planets that are nearby stars to detect their atmospheres and understand their atmospheric composition. Now, why do we want to understand their atmospheres? Because the atmosphere basically acts as a Rosetta Stone for everything we want to know about a planet. Based on the bulk parameters, you can know some broad uh, planetary structure and so on, but you really need to get atmospheric observations to understand. I'm showing in the cartoon there are various atmospheric processes, the temperature structures, i.e. radiative processes, uh, chemical processes, vertical mixing, dynamical process in the atmosphere, clouds, thermal inversions, escape process, all of these are intertwined. They're all talking to each other. And what you see at the end of the day is a spectrum 
with the chemical features imprinted uh, on that spectrum. By looking at those chemical compositions of these atmospheres, the goal is to back out all these atmospheric processes. Okay? So, so that's, the, that's the big picture. That's why we want to study these atmospheres. Now, there are many ways, uh, three uh, to four ways to understand, to look at exoplanet atmospheres, but I won't have time to go through all of them in this talk. So I'll give you uh, just one technique here, which is transit spectroscopy. This is the technique where the orbital inclination of the system is aligned in such a way that you can infer the planet going in front of the star by seeing small dips of the starlight when the planet is crossing uh, the line of sight. So that the size of that dip uh, I've shown here in that little equation there is just the ratio of the annular area of the planet over the star, so the planet radius or the star radius squared. Now, if you measure that dip as a function of wavelength, you get a spectrum, it, what is known as a transmission spectrum, and that tells you the composition of the atmosphere of the planet, because depending on the thickness of the atmosphere, your radius of the planet changes. Okay, it depends on uh, what wavelength the atmosphere is opaque at. So the bottom uh, right uh, there shows a spectrum obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope um, about a decade ago. Okay? And that was the best spectrum at the time. So we have heard that JWST is revolutionizing exoplanet science, so I want to show you in one plot what that actually means. So current spe the HST spectrum went only up to 1.7 micron, and you are seeing that it's a spectrum of a hot Jupiter, a Jupiter-sized planet, roughly. And with JWST, the kind of spectra we're getting um, are, is this. So here you are seeing spectra of, uh, I mean, two, with two different instruments of a planet, also a hot Jupiter, uh, more like a Saturn mass, but Jupiter radius. Um, you can see features of carbon dioxide, some uh, sulfide compounds, water vapor, and so on. That wavelength range and that sensitivity had never been achieved uh, for any exoplanet in the past. Okay, these are literally the first time. Uh, this is li literally the first time these molecules have been detected in these uh, in these objects. Water was the only molecule that was detected before, but everything else is new. Now, as I said, I won't go into too much detail into all aspects of planets that we can learn of, uh, learn about. Uh, but I'll put the fundamental questions we are answering in the field across the board. How do planets form and evolve based on these compositions? We are being able to put constraints on their formation and evolutionary mechanisms. What, how diverse are planetary processes? All those processes I showed you in that cartoon, all of them we can study with these latest observations. And finally, are we alone? So in the rest of my talk, I'm just going to focus on that last uh, point. Now, what, is, uh, I, what I've already mentioned is the sub-Neptune regime, that density of points you see between Earth and Neptune in size, between one to four Earth radii. That's where the uh, dominant exoplanet population lies. The important uh, bit there is that planets in that regime span a whole range of possible internal structures that uh, we don't have in the solar system. So on the left is shown the Earth, on the right is shown Neptune there are, that are with very different atmospheric compositions, if you think about it. The Earth is mostly, Earth and terrestrial planets are mostly secondary atmospheres that are very heavy, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, O2, and so on. Neptune, on the other hand, is hydrogen-rich atmosphere. So what the compositions, the interior and atmospheric compositions of the planets in between would be, we have no clue. Okay. So with JWST, we are revolutionizing this frontier by, for the first time, being able to look peer into the atmospheres of those planets and understand a bit about their internal structures and surface conditions and so on. Be because we are talking about habitability, the a, a, a nominal definition uh, used in the field is this uh, of habitable zone, which is basically the distance from a given star where you could have liquid water on the surface of an Earth-like planet. Okay, so as the star cools, on the y-axis uh, is the stellar mass, so as the star gets smaller and cooler, you see that the habitable zone also gets closer to the star because you can be closer to the star and still uh, have the same sort of irradiation. So this is the trick uh, we have been using to look at small planets around small stars. Uh, so they can be closer to the star's uh, smaller orbital periods and still be habitable. So obviously, um, as Didier mentioned in his talk, one of the very promising habitable pl uh, planet systems is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which had four habitable planets uh, uh, in, around an M dwarf. 
So people went ahead and put a lot of JWST time to look at these planets, and this is the one of the uh, first spectra obtained of that one of those planets, Trappist 1b, and uh, it's. it's it shows, I mean, it shows the power of JWST in getting down to the precisions. We are talking about a few tens of parts per million, but what we have found, unfortunately, is that the spectrum is still pretty much flat. We couldn't detect any uh, spectral features uh, in, with various efforts. A second point we also realized is that spec, uh, stellar contamination is a key challenge when we look at uh, planets like these. So uh, bottom line is that rocky planets, even around small stars, are still very hard even with JWST and efforts are underway. But then we asked a bigger question on what are the limits of how big actually can we go in planet mass, size, and uh, higher temperatures and still be habitable um, to, to give us the best chance for habitability. So in order to do that, we tried with this test system uh, called K218b. This is a habitable zone planet, but the mass of the planet is around nine Earth masses. The radius is about two and a half Earth radii. Coincidentally, this was one of the first examples where machine learning experts, uh, including Bernard uh, from the Max Planck uh, Institute, who is sitting here, uh, partnered with astronomers to make detections of systems like this, a very early example. Now, this, was, uh, this is in the habitable zone of its uh, host star. So we tried to determine, look at internal structure models, and uh, see if uh, this planet can actually be habitable. Because otherwise, the conventional notion is that Two and a half radi Earth radii is too big for the planet uh, to have a liquid water surface because the pressure and temperature from the hydrogen atmosphere on top of it could make it inhospitable. But what we found, long story short, is that actually the density does allow a subset of solutions uh, that are in the liquid phase of water. So you are seeing the water equation of state in the background, but the <coughs> but the red curves show the loci of uh, temperatures and pressures at the surface. So based on uh, this uh, theoretical success, we went ahead and did a much broader parameter exploration, and we found that actually there's a wide range of planets uh, with different masses and uh, radii that can actually be habitable, even if they're significantly larger than Earth. And we call these Haitian planets, you may have heard in the news, that's basically a portmanteau of hydrogen and ocean. That, that combination is, uh, we named it as Haitian. And these are planets where you'd expect the habitable zone, actually, to be significantly broader than the terrestrial, the narrow terrestrial habitable zone. And that increases the number of planets you can look at with JWST and still be able to detect atmospheric signatures, including biosignatures. So to uh, cheer you up, this would be, uh, this is an artist rendition of, of a Haitian world, which would be an ocean covered world with a hydrogen rich atmosphere. Now, let me show you some real data with JWST. So that was the uh, HST spectrum uh, in the pre-JWST era of this planet, that little blip you see between 1 to 1.8 micron. Um, and now let me show you the JWST spectrum. That is with only 14 hours of JWST time. Just two observations, 14 hours, that's the quality of spectrum you get. So in this one spectrum, we made the first detections of carbon-based molecules, methane and CO2, in a habitable zone exoplanet ever. So you can see the contributions. I've showed you contributions at the bottom there of various molecules that could be contributing to the spectrum. So it becomes, at this point, an inference uh, problem where Bayesian techniques and machine learning techniques would be very adaptable. And we're able to pull out very robust signatures of methane and CO2, a tentative signature of a potential biomarker, dimethyl sulfide. We are not very uh, confident about that yet, but this is the kind of data that gives you all those features. I won't go into too much time here on the chemistry uh, in the interest of time. Um, I'll just say that the inferences we are making of the molecules, the CO2, methane, and the lack of other molecules like ammonia and carbon monoxide is giving us some really good indications of the presence of an ocean surface, as was predicted even before the observations were taken. Uh, so, so that was a triumph of theory meeting observations. Now, this, uh, to summarize, is the first insights into a potential habitable world with JWST that we could be uh, studying uh, in the years to come. And then the natural question is, oh, did we get lucky? Is this a one-time case, or are there other objects like this? Just earlier this year, uh, we observed another uh, uh, planet, and we found that, um, so this was a partner observation with another team, but both teams found uh, the, uh, the same sort of molecules, methane and CO2, in yet another 
a planet with very similar characteristics. So what we're seeing actually is a new class of temperate worlds which could be potentially habitable, and this is what is making us confident in the search for robust biosignatures. On the right there is showing you the Earth spectrum. You can see all the molecules that we see if you look at Earth from space, but there are many other molecules that we could be looking at with JWST in the infrared that have been predicted to be robust biomarkers by various studies uh, in, in the past. Uh, so he, this is where we need a confluence of astronomers, um, biologists, planetary scientists, chemists, and statistical uh, inference uh, expertise, both from Bayesian techniques and machine learning, uh, to come together to make this happen in a, in a robust way. So we are doing atmospheric reconnaissance currently of several such planets. We have, uh, as a field, we have hundreds of, a few hundreds of hours of JWST time already allocated. So stay tuned. In the next year, you'll see a lot more uh, results from these programs, uh, at least half a dozen programs with high quality detections like this and uh, various efforts are underway in collaborations with, with, with biologists, uh, astronomers, uh, chemists, and so on, as well as uh, machine learning experts. So the promise of this decade is really that it will search as the launch pad in the search for life. If we are lucky, we may actually detect biosignatures. But if not, we will still learn a lot about what are the conditions that, are con that may be conducive for life elsewhere in planets that are very different from Earth. So my question, um, as I conclude, in my mind, it's not a question of whether we'll be detecting biosignatures in the near future. I'm pretty confident we should be able to do that in this decade, if not, if not this decade, in the next couple of decades. A bigger question in my mind is, are we actually prepared to find life as we don't know it? In other words, we might detect the biosignature, but it may take us a while to realize that it's actually a biosignature. Thank you.